What is up, movers? Um, it's been a while since I made a video. If one of you guys caught the last game I played, you would have heard that I said that I was kind of under the weather and sick, but I am feeling a good bit better now, and uh, I want to go over a tournament that I played, and it occurred, I think it was November 18th, so it was like two weeks ago, week and a half ago, and um, I competed in the Columbia U1600 tournament, which, for those of you who don't understand over-the-board play, means that I played against other players under 1600 ranking, and that's USCF rating, so it's a separate rating system from that of chess.com, and um, normally players are a lot better uh, in over-the-board play, um, partially because they have more time to uh, make their moves, and then partially the atmosphere, partially they're just tournament players, which means that um, they have experience in a lot of positions that online players might not, but Regardless, I competed in the U1600, um, and I just want to go over my games here. Uh, as you can see from the thumbnail, uh, spoiler alert, I did end up winning the tournament. Um, I tied for first, so there was another player that shared first place with me. Um, but anyway, I wanted to dive into the games that I played and kind of go over my thought process and stuff. Uh, let me turn off the computer stuff, and we'll just go through the moves. Since I was on board one, I played on... Uh, what's called a DGT board, which means that it records all your moves in live time along with a clock. So I'm able to play back most of my games uh, since I was on board one most of the time. And um, DGT boards are very expensive, and I would like to eventually get one for making my own content. But as for now, I'll just have to play on them every once in a while at tournaments if I'm, excuse me, the top seed. But anyway, without further ado, uh, this is game one. I had the white pieces against my opponent, Ian. And you already know we're playing B4 even in tournament play. So, oh boy, let me not do that. So start with B4. We're going to get uh, E4 and E5 in response. As you can see, this shows the time situation right here. So I played bishop to B2. And we get the capture variation, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but it's also because I'm kind of not prepared. So we see the knight f6 line, and I go for this because I'm always looking for a nice cheese. And then my mindset is that if he doesn't fall for the cheese, which normally they don't in classical. Um, but the idea is that it's just a simple game to play after that. And for my first game of the tournament, I didn't want to get into something too complicated. I'd rather just like trade some things off, not worry about getting checkmated out of nowhere or anything stupid like that. So I figured I'd go for this variation. Alternatively, what I could do is just develop this way play back, maybe play c3, then play for d4 later, something along those lines. That keeps more pieces on the board for a longer time, which is also smarter against a lower rated opponent. But I wanted comfort for my first game. So you guys have probably seen this happen a lot when I play online, when they don't fall for it. And here we just get to a very simple game. <clears throat> I just develop some pieces. I kick the queen out. Queen goes back, and I'm looking to get this nice setup, and then eventually push for like f4 or something. I don't want to necessarily play e3 just yet if I don't need to. Um, e3 is good when I'm supporting b5 or when I have a pawn on c4 or something like that, but otherwise there's no real purpose, so I wanted to clear a, a spot here for my bishop. As you can see, he already used up 8 minutes, and it's probably a little closer to like 9 just because you get additional time back uh, in this format. I think it was a 45 plus 5 or 10. So in the opening, even though it's very simple and uh, not a whole lot to calculate, you could still see that this opening does take some time off your opponent's clock. So it is better for like shorter 45 minute, 30 minute tournaments. So right here, I actually need to be careful because if I take the knight and just don't think about it, then he's going to grab the bishop. And then I have two pieces that are being threatened. And all of a sudden he goes back and I can't castle anymore. So I just had to make sure I played this correctly. So I castled and I gave up my structure. And my idea was that I'll eventually get to play f4 at the right moment. And that I currently have a nice file for my rook. So that was the mindset that I had early on here. We get castle. Uh, I just play a4. I'm trying to break apart this structure, not this, this structure that he has. So I'm just trying to have him play b5 or something similar, and then I can play a6. 
and uh, he's going to end up on a weird square where eventually maybe I could get an attack going and have a pass pawn. But uh, <clears throat> he just counters it right away, a5. I play d4. I'm just trying to make some room here, and I want to get my queen out, and I want some options as to where I want to place my queen. We get queen to e6. So I, of course, get my rook more so in the center. Threaten the queen. I have to support the pawn, and I also double my rooks. We get rook over to e8. And what I want to do here is double up. And then what could happen is I might fix my pawn structure this way. But he has a similar idea. So I threaten the queen, and I'm hoping to maybe get my bishop onto b5, where I can threaten this, or just block his bishop in, something along those lines. It's a thought process that I have here. And he just goes over uh, queen to d5. Now, it's not a threat just yet that he could take on f3 because my rook supports it but it will become a threat because he could just take this. And then all of a sudden I'm going to be down a pawn and he's threatening checkmate. So to combat that, I just move my rook over. And my idea here is that I could start playing like c4 and d5 and kind of block his bishop out, make it useless this game. And you'll see that he doubles up. I say, all right, I have some tempo here. And now his bishop is blocked, but his rook is going to be a lot more active. So I take, take, and then I go queen to uh, d2. Um, alternatively, I was considering the move queen to c3. And the reason why I didn't end up choosing queen to c3 was because he would have queen e5. And then it would be like he was trying to trade these off, essentially. Uh, I just didn't really like the feel of that kind of position where here I also like that I could play d6 and kind of make like a, a battery if I wanted to. Um, I also want to see if I could bait him over to a1 where I would just be pretty happy I guess is the best way of saying it. But he chooses to go queen to e5 anyway. I go f4 just fix my pawns. He goes queen to e4 and now here I was considering sacking my queen for the rook and what actually happens is we just trade back because he can't move out of the way because he just gets mated but the thing is I wanted to fix my structure and if I did this maneuver then my structure is kind of weird whereas I'm not super happy with it um, so instead I chose to just put my rook here immediately all right I, I may have described that wrong this was the structure that I wanted, but there was a way that that didn't happen otherwise. So let me see if I can go back and find that for you guys. So if I were to take and take in here, uh, right, this is what it was. So what happens is that now I try the same thing, and all of a sudden he has king activation. I still have the bad pawn. So that is why I did not take the rook and then force it, because he had another way to defend. And... Uh, yeah, that's just why you have to think about every angle when you play games. In a 10 minute, I probably wouldn't have thought about it. I would have thought, oh, that's a cool tactic. You know, I could take on E1 and then force the exchange, or I could bait him into checkmate. But it actually ends up a much worse position now that I have a bad pawn setup, and his is rather good. Um, my saving grace here is kind of that I have a better bishop than his, but he also has easy ways to break through, and then all of a sudden my pawns are kind of weak, so I'll actually have to probably play defense. But anyway, we get into an end game of sorts. Uh, I didn't go back far enough. Yes, this is what actually happened. Okay. <clears throat> so like I said, he's going to start doing this immediately. So I just go to support it. He's going to activate his king. I'm going to activate mine. And we both centralize our kings a little bit. And what I do here is actually a little um, suspect. And the reason why it's suspect is because I'm pretty much letting him get access to these pawns. And I had nine minutes on my clock, but that's not nearly enough time to calculate an endgame like this. At my strength, at least, right now. So I was kind of calling his bluff, more or less. And I was saying, I'm giving you the option 
to go back. But that would mean that my position just drastically improved and you made a concession. You wasted some moves with your king and I got a free pawn move and a free king move. So he chose to go here. Whether he calculated this or not, I could not tell you, but he did choose to go here. This pawn is protected by my um, my bishop, but this is not. So what would happen is takes, takes, and takes, and he's going to be a pawn up. And I can't really protect like this either. So what I do instead is I just push the pawn. And the idea here is that I could kind of make trouble for him by either sacking a bishop at the right moment and then promoting, or I could just like threaten this and the only way he can save it is by going bishop here, so he's just gonna end up useless, or I could like target multiple things. So that's my idea with a d6, but I don't have a way to defend this pawn. So he goes a pawn up. Right, so he's a pawn up in the endgame, but if you notice which pawn he has up, it's the a pawn. And if you know a thing about endgames, you know that it's hard to promote the a pawn when your king is in front of it and the other king is close because what you have to do is you have to step out of the way in order to promote it through and i'm going to try to like basically blockade him over here so that my pawn difference doesn't really matter and then i'll be able to create my own pawn storm here on the king side and that's pretty much what happens and i grab a pawn King goes here, I'm going to threaten to take one more, and then I do take it. And now pretty much what happens here is he is trying to use these two pawns to promote one of them against me, but I still have a bishop to defend. So I'll always be able to sack the bishop for at least one of the pawns, and then as long as my king is back here, I could just step right in front of the other pawn, and I'll be completely fine. So... I push this guy out of the way, pretty much just tell him if you want to grab this, I'm going to pick this up. We see uh, b2 check, so I just move here, and then it doesn't really matter um, which I chose to do, because the idea is that if the king tries to go here, my bishop's just going to cover the square, and then I'll just sack the bishop at the right moment. Yep, so I cover the square, and even, even now, I mean... He can't ever do this. My king is even in contact with the bishop, so I'll just be winning the pawn for free. And now I'm able to start pushing over here. So I get a pawn. And he has a few ideas that he's trying to do here with this move. So first off, he's trying to just kind of block. Sorry, this is the way that he would do it. He's just trying to block the bishop's scope, so we trade and then he promotes. So that's one thing he's trying to do. The other thing that he's trying to do is sack this bishop at the right moment, and then when I move the bishop, then I'm gonna he's going to be able to promote. So what I do is I create my own pass pawn. I play e6, and it's actually faster than uh, his solutions. So he's trying to do this, where I think his better bet would have been to do this, and I would have taken, and then it wouldn't be a super comfortable endgame for me because he would get his queen. So even though I'd be up material, he would have his queen before I would have mine. And in a closer proximity where I'm at risk of getting checkmated. So I actually don't know if I'm winning here by computer, but I knew it wouldn't be a comfortable way of doing it. But I think he wasn't wanting to sacrifice his uh, you know, bishop for a queen when I'm going to get one as well. So anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, you see the clock right here. So I have a minute on my clock, and he has... A little over three minutes um, so I push he is going to sacrifice the bishop so I'm gonna take he's gonna take and then I promote and now he can't even turn into a queen because I'm just gonna check him pick it up and then I have more than enough pawns to create another pass pawn here that he's never gonna be able to get to and he did Okay, so the move stopped recording right here, so this must be when the game ended, when he uh, resigned. But that was game one, so I took a one-point lead. Um, I was never really winning <clears throat> in this first game. It was more so just an end game where I think I 
had a decent idea and stuck to it where I think he was kind of wishy-washy on what he wanted to do because he decided that he was going to push these pawns but then he kind of did not get anything out of it and I stuck with my plan of just picking these off and then surviving back here with just my king so I think that was kind of what led to the first game ending how it did uh, so let's hit the second game up so we'll go to round two um, here we go all right so this game I played the opposite color. Let me see if I can flip this board. Mm. I might not be able to reload. Okay, I might just be stupid. I might not know how to flip the board here. Um. All right, anyway. So he started with e4. I play b6, we get knight to c3, you know, I'm playing my normal b6 opening, so I threaten it, he plays d4 because it's protected, I play e6, he's going to play b3, I pin the knight so that I'm going to be able to pick up this pawn, and he actually did something weird too because now he has to protect this knight, so I think he's already kind of losing at this point. Um, he has to protect this and he can't protect it in any way where he's also going to be protecting this. He can move the knight here, but I'm just going to take the pawn. So nothing actually works. I think I'm just going to be going a pawn up here, which ended up happening. He threatens my bishop and this pawn here. So all I do is I bait him and I offer him a pawn here so that I get some really good development. And he accepts. So I just put my rook onto g8 and I lose my castling privileges. But if you look at what pieces I have already involved in this game and like the pins that I have available, and he's kind of doing absolutely nothing, then I'm pretty happy with this. Even consi sorry, also considering that I picked up that e4 pawn previously. So he moves his queen out of the way. I'm going to grab this. So I picked up another pawn on him right there. We're going to see a3. Excuse me. And I don't think I want to go back. Yeah, so I just captured. Recapture. And now I played knight to e4. <coughs> so now I'm trying to get both this bishop and this pawn. Um, there was another idea I had, which was just taking this pawn. And then obviously what happens here is I would just fork him. But I didn't like the fact that he doesn't necessarily have to take right here. So I was thinking he might like move this to threaten the rook or something. And then all of a sudden, you know, my rook is just out of place. And then I have to struggle to find like a weird square for it to fit on. Or I could have had a lot less trouble just playing this move. Getting my pieces involved and getting an opening for my queen. So he supported the bishop. And I decided to get my queen involved here, and I offered a trade. I said, you know, I'm a pawn up. I think my structure is slightly better than yours. Let's go ahead and trade these off. And that was actually a mistake, because here he gets knight to g to uh, g3, and my rook is trapped um, with king f1 coming in a second. So I put my knight here on g4, and the idea is that no matter what he does, whether he goes king f1, whether he goes h3, or whether he goes f3, the idea is that I'm able to save my rook. So if he goes here, I'm just able to take a check, and then he's free the next move. If he chooses to kick the knight, then I'm just going to take, I think it was this piece right here, right? Or was that not it? Here, maybe it was this. Here, I'll turn on the eval, just because I it's hard to look at it from this position. I remember being on black and doing it, obviously. But it's not letting me flip the board that I can easily see. So, uh, lines is what I want. So here what happens is, okay, so it would be knight takes, and then I'm threatening the rook. So even if he goes here, then I'm able to take and take. And I could do this in any order that I want, really. Rook takes g3. He takes here, then the bishop gets taken. 
then what happens the other way is that I'm able to just take this pawn, and then the king can't threaten the rook anymore. However, there was one thing that he could have done here that I think was making me lose, and that was knight e4, is that it? It doesn't sound right. Um... I thought for sure I was losing more than this. Okay, I mean, I guess the computer's saying I still have an advantage here. But I think there was a move like this that kind of still made things awkward for me. Because then my rook is still not comfortable. Like, I can't take because he's just grabbing the rook. I still can't run away. I mean, I could take here, I guess. But then after we get this trade, then knight f6 check comes through and I lose castling. King d7. And then, what was the move? Ah, that's what it is. So he just activates his pieces and he's castling. So even though I'm a pawn, or two pawns up, I mean, he has a lot more uh, going on in his board. So he doesn't really have to worry about that. Not to mention this escape route is taken away. But anyway, there's quite a few moves out. Uh, really, I just kind of didn't see the fact that he could block my rook. So I just wanted to make sure this took care of almost all the tactics that he could immediately punish and he decided to go bishop to b4 and I took the pawn let me turn this off now so now he plays uh, what's it called h3 and he's uh, targeting the rook what am I talking about he's targeting the knight that is protecting the rook so what I have to do is I have to attack his knight uh, as well. So he takes, I take, and then we essentially just traded one for one. But it gets a little more sketchy now. So he takes, and if I just take this without thinking, then what occurs is I just get mated because the bishop covers the escapes. So before I make a dumb move like that, I played d6. The idea is now if he tries it, I have an escape route. Um, not to mention that... Uh, you know, I could get this guy out still. Um, the only thing is I can't do that immediately afterwards because he would just take this piece. But I was thinking that I could kind of run maybe king to b7 and then play this. And then all of a sudden it's not all that bad. Uh, and in the meanwhile, I can grab a pawn here. So it's not like I'm not doing anything else in the meanwhile. But he actually made a blunder right here and he defended the pawn on g4 and just completely missed the basic tactic of rook down to g1 where I'm picking this up and yeah this game was resigned at this point right here um, yes I mean he has some opportunities I think to maybe push this a little bit and then even protect it correctly maybe not if he went king here but if we went king e2 then maybe he could protect this pawn for a little bit and then kind of keep this rook from coming out for a good while. But uh, yeah, it was still going to be very much losing form. So he just resigned. Uh, so that was game two. Now let's find game three. So it's this game. Uh, and I was back on the white pieces. So of course we're playing b4 here. Uh, my opponent plays d5, which I'm actually happy to see, because it means we don't see the exchange variation. We get bishop b2, bishop to f5. Just get the knight out, and the reason I get the knight out on turn 3 as opposed to playing e3 is because I want to stay flexible in case I want to play g3 instead. Something new that I've been trying that I've been very much enjoying. Uh, I decided I wanted to play e3 here anyway because I want to contest this center that he has, whereas if I do this, I'm kind of just like giving up the center and saying, you know, you do you, buddy, and then I'm not going to worry about it. So he goes knight over to d7. I play c4. Of course, he's not going to take for no reason. He's going to make this structure instead. I go bishop over to e2. He gets knight to uh, f6. I play a3 because now this isn't protected, and I don't have this as a counter threat. We're going to see pawn take now, and the reason he's doing this now is because I already wasted tempo going to e2, so now I have to spend another tempo grabbing on c4, not to mention that now he has a nice pawn chain, so I'm staring into nothing. Um, he could also threaten it a move later, so that, that's kind of the thought process he has. 
which is what he does. And I have an option to go here to E2 and reset, or I can bring it to B3 or to A2. And I figured I wanted to keep the diagonal as opposed to give it up and play conservatively. Um, I think this would have been the better move because now he could kind of play this annoying move and then I'm just kind of stuck for a little while until I play some other moves to free myself. Excuse me. But he doesn't choose to do that anyway. He's just wanting to castle. <clears throat> so I get some more pieces out. He castles and I wish I castled here. I really do because I think I would have went on to win this game. But instead what I do is I just choose to attack with my four minor pieces that I have developed because I kind of like their placement. And I figure this bishop doesn't have a great square to go. So I'm thinking I'm just improving this piece really. But I completely missed that he had this square available. So I was thinking that he was just going to retreat to, uh, what's it called, g6. And that I might be able to play like an h4, h5. Or that I could castle and then play f4, f5. You know, these were the ideas I was having completely missed the fact that he could just slide in here and that I don't have an easy way to get rid of it. So I get my queen out and I kind of, I don't like this move because I was kind of bluffing when I played this move. I was basically saying, I don't care about this. I'm not going to castle anyway. I'm just going to start sending pawns at you and I have like well enough placed pieces that I don't care that I can't castle. But I ended up regretting that. So we see e5 played. So I move here, and then he plays knight over to uh, c4. And he is quite quickly impeding on my uh, pieces that I had here and their long reach. So I had to sack the bishop, which I wasn't a big fan of because he also moved one of the important pawns that he had here. But it would have been much worse, I think, for me to have gone here, for example. And now my rook is stuck. I can't even go to b1 if I wanted to. Um, I mean, this just looks kind of nasty all over. So I figured I'd just give him my bishop. And I played e4, because I really did not want him playing e4 himself. And I was hoping that at the right moment, I could play something like rook d1, and maybe try to kick the bishop. And even if he tries to go to b3, I could sit down on d2, because my dark squares are actually not too bad. It's my light squares that have been compromised. But, unfortunately, I was all too slow, and my opponent fortunately didn't realize. Because I wanted to take this bishop, and then play d3, and then he has to recapture with the queen, and then when I play d3, he can go here, but then I can castle. So I feel like my trouble has been avoided, kind of. Unfortunately, I missed this move entirely, which is stupid, because it's a really obvious move. Just straight up rookie 8. And now all of a sudden I do this, and he just recaptures with rook. And now this move, he still has two defenders. So it's actually not that good for me. So I decide, okay, well, you know, I'm kind of in trouble here. But let me see if I can still make some sort of attack happen. And now here I'm obviously threatening mate in one. I'm also threatening to go right here. So he plays uh, g6. And I just check him. He goes up. I check him again. He goes back, so I was like, all right, well, I don't like my position, so I'll gladly take the draw. And that is actually what happened. So he went here. So I thought this was him saying, I don't want to draw, I want to play on, because I can't actually take right here, since it's protected by the bishop. But, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, okay, maybe I did miss this. Because what could happen here is um, I could play this. And then if he takes in one way, then I can grab this pawn. So actually, I probably would have been better off in this position after he went here. Maybe not better off, but I, I could have survived it. Because here he loses the queen. And if he takes with queen, then takes, bishop takes. Then I take here with check, and I'm going to take here next. So still don't like the position, but... It's a lot more playable than it was before. Um, let me actually see what the computer says here. Okay, so they say it's rather equal. Yeah, that's what I thought. And I think they don't actually like this. Okay, they're just saying this is equal. Obviously, this taking we already described was losing, so we're not even going to look at that. 
But uh, yeah, it's pretty equal at this point. He offered me a draw, and I took it. I did not see this uh, tactic um, in the game, so I thought I was just free from my problems. Um, and anyway, this was two and a half out of three points, so I was still in contention for winning at this point. So I said, yeah, you know, I'll take the draw in a weird position I don't understand. Uh, and now is when it's going to get slightly inconvenient for my good watchers, because the last game... Since I drew, I wasn't on board one anymore, which means the board I was playing on was a regular plastic set, as opposed to a DGT where it's all recorded. So I had to, I have to just go over it on this sheet right here. But uh, this shouldn't be too bad, as long as I wrote it down all right. But yeah, that finally let us flip the board, and let's go over game four. So game four, um, the way the tournament was, one person was actually still undefeated. Not undefeated, but they were 3-0. And both myself and the person I just played in the previous round were at 2.5. So if he lost, because he was paired against the person that was 3.0, if he lost, then I had no shot at winning. So I was kind of, you know, rooting for him. And he did end up beating that guy, so I just had to make sure I won my game as well, and then I would tie him for first place. So this is that fourth game where I needed a win to win the tournament with him. But anyway, we get e4, b6, I'm going to turn this off for now, <clears throat> uh, d4, you know, we play bishop to b7, that's all normal, we get knight c3, e6, we get knight f3, so I pin this of course, and then after bishop to b4, we get bishop to d3, so I play knight to f6, we have to go through this line, we get e5, and knight to e4. And this isn't hanging, of course, because he can't recapture with a knight. So this is just me offering to take right here. So he has to support this if he doesn't want to lose the rook. So, of course, we're going to see just straight up bishop to d2 happen right here. Um, knight takes on c3. Uh, bishop takes c3. All right. All right, I wrote something wrong, but I could figure this out. Takes, takes, and then pawn takes. So we exchange all that off. So takes on c3, and then we play d6. So the idea here is, of course, to just get the knight out, and then be fluid in which way we want to castle. Um, I also commonly would like to play this to f8, and then bring it to g6, uh, just because it'll be a lot more useful there. Whereas here, I'm blocking my bishop, and I could kind of get pinned my my own piece, which is not comfortable whatsoever. So I'd rather just do something like this and then potentially, you know, be able to castle this way. Uh, also, when the knight is on d7, I can play for stuff like c5 and then just have a good position here as well. But um, <clears throat> anyway, after d6, we get castle. So I play that knight d7 move and then he takes on d6. So I recapture, of course. So it takes on d6. We get the recapture, and then we get queen e2. So he's gunning down my king. And I actually don't really want to castle right here, because I think that's actually a forced mate. If I'm not misunderstood. Let me turn this on for a second. This is probably just forced mate. Oh, it's not? Oh, because the queen takes. Okay. I was thinking of the queen not being, like, say the queen was here or something. Then that becomes a forced mate. Anyway, my apologies. So this occurs. And then after the queen comes over to e2, we get rook to c8. I'm just trying to uh, tackle these pawns right here. I also don't like my rook being in line with a potential bishop, because it means I kind of have to exchange or I have to put my rook on, like, a bad square. So I'd rather just take this, make some threats instead. Um, if the bishop comes here now, more than happy to make this kind of exchange. Uh, but anyway, rook c8, and then we get, if I could find my notes, c4. So he just protects it, but through protecting it, he is actually blocking his own bishop. So I kind of like that he has no scope with his pieces now. I'm pretty happy with that. Um... Yeah, c4, I bring my queen to f6, 
So I'm threatening this pawn, you know, taking, he takes in some fashion, and then I grab this. And then conversely, what I'm also threatening is just taking here, and then I did that out of order. But what happens is he ends up with two pawns right here, and then one pawn there, and then that's just an end game. I'm comfortable with playing out, because I should be able to win that. <clears throat> so what he does after queen f6 is d5. So he just blocks my bishop. He threatens to take right here, and things could get a little uncomfortable rather quickly once he gets a rook there as well. So what I did is I decided to say, who cares, and just castled. And now if he does this, I have two centralized pawns, and I'm fully stacked up over here. Uh, not to mention that this capture would be available. So he does take on e6, but it's important I don't take here yet, because then he takes one more time with a check. So I would have to then grab right here. Actually, that's not even too bad, because then I could take. Um, so what happens here? We get takes, I take back, rook f to e1. And I think this is where I decided to grab this, because I saw a tactic forming. Um, let me double check though. Yeah, so I take right here. So he could offer up his queen, and I'll be winning a pawn. And then I think he thought this was fine because he picks up a pawn at the end. However, it doesn't exactly go in his favor. So he's going to pick this up with a queen, if I recall correctly. Yep. So I take, he takes, and now he thought I was going to take right here, but instead I played knight e5. So what I did is I delayed it by a move. And now all of a sudden the whole dynamic has kind of changed. So now what happens is this is being threatened, but mine is not. If he chooses to defend it like so, I can either just scoop it up just like that, or I could pick this up, grab, grab, and then, you know, I'd say that this is a lot less comfortable because now I'm protecting this and threatening this. If he chooses to try protecting like that, I could just sack my rook, if my arrow will draw, then all of a sudden I get that pawn up and I have a pass pawn. So a few ways to play it, but I should be winning, and the king doesn't even defend this uh, right now. And if he goes here, then I could just pick this up. I think that is what he chose to do. He went bishop to e2. Let me verify, though. So we see... Um, bishop e2, yep. So I want to say I pick this. Which one did I pick up? Because I could pick up either of these. I think I picked up this one because it forces the exchange. And then after takes, 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 then I'm threatening this. And he doesn't have a way to defend it. I don't believe he can go there. But then I grab this. So no matter which way I spin it here, I should end up a clean pawn up and better rooks. So his should be, or will be, rather defensive, whereas mine are going to be working coordination to pick up more pawns and to, you know, potentially get some checks in against the king. And there's always a mate threat with the king being on the back line and rooks on the seventh. So that was my thought process here. So I'm pretty sure I took on f3. Yep. So it takes, takes, I take, of course, and then he takes, does he take on e3? Or e6, rather? Let's see. He takes, bishop takes, rook takes, king g2. Okay, so he chose to do this instead, so now I have to just defend this instead. So I just drop back to f6. And when I drop back to f6, he went rook to e4. So now he is defending, but his pawns are just worse. So he has one, two, three, four, five different pawns that are completely separated. Whereas I have one, two, three, four, five, six. So for one, I have a pawn advantage. For two, I have three pairs of pawns, which means at any moment I can support them. And he has, he doesn't have that luxury. Is pretty much the way that this game is going. So he goes rookie four, and I play, if I can find it probably d5, then what happens is I threaten the rook, and then I'm getting this, and threatening there, is what I'm thinking I played, but let me make sure, because I haven't looked over this game in a few, like a week, um, <laughs> king f7, so I chose to uh, protect this instead, and improve my king's position, which I think was the better move. Because this requires more calculation. I don't re remember what the time was. I think I still had a good bit. 
but I'd rather just play a move that for sure is good versus a move that might just screw things up. Because what happens here is that I all of a sudden have an isolated pawn, and, you know, before they were connected, so I thought, well, instead of doing that and having a bad king, why don't I improve the king? His pawns are still bad, and I figured I'd see what he wants to do first. So, king f7, uh, we get d4. That's not possible, is it? Okay, a4 is what that was. <clears throat> My a's look like d's. But he's trying to do this, and then I would have to take, and then he grabs, and all of a sudden he can pick this up. He has check. Um, this guy can't push anymore. So what he's trying to do is turn his one pawns into destroying my chains. So that's kind of how you want to play that. Um, so he played a4. I played h6. So I'm kind of like baiting him, like saying, okay, go ahead. You know, I'll allow you to do that. And uh, I wasn't planning on taking right here. I was planning on letting him take. And then I could just play b6 or take on b6 rather. And I just want to kind of make a space for my king to run with these pawns and start advancing. So h6, he went rook to d1. So he's trying to take this. I think I went rook c6. No, I play d5 now. So same premise. I take, threaten the rook, and then I'm threatening to take this. Um, what changed now though from before is that for one, he might be more inclined to take it because he thinks he's gaining a pawn, but this actually is not defendable anymore, this pawn here. So this is actually a poison pawn. And for two, he has to actually defend it like this. And then I can just play rook c5 and then rook a5. And then eventually I have some good things happen in there. Whereas the whole time this is occurring, I can improve my king. So that's kind of what changed about the position where I'm now more comfortable playing d5. Um, and he took once, and I took back, and then he played rook e2. So I think he actually took this, not realizing what would happen. He probably thought he was just giving his pawn back, and then he realized that that's actually not the case because this isn't defensible. So he just drops back to e2, and I don't remember which move I made. It was probably this as opposed to rook c5, but we'll see in a moment. Uh, so rook e2. Uh, from white and then rook c5. So I played this move. Okay, this was probably better now that I think about it um, But I think they're both fine I think what I really wanted is just him not to play a5 because then I have to play something like this and then After he pushes again, I'm just not too happy. I don't think Maybe it's actually fine because I could take but for whatever reason I played c5 as opposed to rook d6 Maybe I was just happy with threatening this and cutting off his king squares um, I don't remember my complete thought process at the time, but I don't think it's a bad move whatsoever. Um, also improves this rook from being way back there. But we get rook c5, rook d to e1. So his idea here, check, and then pick up this pawn, and then, you know, I have this weird position. I was actually fine with him going here because it means that this is no longer protected. So I don't think I even moved my king or protected this pawn. Let me check though. Uh, yeah, rook c5, rook d to e1, g5. Yeah, so I was basically inviting him to do so and then telling him I'm going to be going here afterwards. And if he tries exchanging these rooks, also fine with me. You could take or I can go here. This is going to get picked up. This is going to run still. Uh, you don't really want this because I get way too much tempo, or I could just beat you to it. So I play g5. Uh, we get rook e7 check, like I said. I went king to g6 in that little hole that I just made. We get rook e1 to e2. So he protects this now with the other rook. He wanted to maintain this rook being here. So I probably went rook a5. Yep, rook a5. We get rook to d7. So he's threatening two pawns, and I'm supporting two pawns and threatening one pawn. So right now everything is still in the balance, but that could change in a moment. So after rook to d7, I played rook takes a4. And I basically said, that's fine. I now have a passed pawn, and it's connected, and I'm losing my isolated pawn. So that was a, a pretty good trade for me, or I should say a, a fine trade for me. I wasn't worried about that. So he takes on d5, 
Then I check him on g4. I think I was more so wondering where his king would go more than anything, because that doesn't really accomplish uh, much. I mean, I wanted to move this out of the way so my A-pawn could start running. So maybe that's what I was doing too, trying to gain tempo doing so. But we get rook to g4, and then king h1. And I think this is the worst of the options he could have done. He probably could have gone... Eh, maybe he couldn't have gone king h3, because it's kind of sus after I play uh, h5. And then he's just kind of getting mated very, very quickly. I mean, he could kind of protect it, but that's just not a place you want to be whatsoever. I mean, I could even do this, maybe something like that. I don't know. Just some ideas, but... Yeah, he plays king h1. <clears throat> I play a5, so I start running with my uh, bonus pawn that I have. And now, hopefully I can get this a few squares and then go behind it would be ideal. But he actually plays defense really well here. So I'm going to probably... I know I've been explaining a lot of these moves that I've been making, but I'm probably going to take a break and just say all the moves. And then uh, after like five, or move, five moves or so, I'll talk about the position afterwards. Because there was a lot of shuffling that was going on here. Because I think now we're approaching like low time territory. Probably sub 10 minutes around there. And I really didn't want to, you know, just lose a game stupidly. Um, when I'm a full pawn up, that's also a pass pawn. So it's probably just making a few moves to shuffle. That is what I was doing. And I just wanted to uh, see if I could catch any blunders from him or notice anything when the position changes a little bit. It's kind of like if you're like building a puzzle. And you just like turn some pieces around or instead of like sorting by colors, now you start by edges. Or maybe you look for like some spec. I don't know. Just like something I was hoping would change once I start shuffling the pieces around a little bit. But yeah, let me just make a few of these moves right here. So we get C3. We get Rook to C4. Um, Rook to C2. Defending it. Rook to, oh god, I cannot tell what that is. It's something to something six. Well, the only thing that can, uh, I guess this could go e6. So this is either e6, or this is coming to c6. So what, what did I mean here? Oh god, I kind of hate myself because this could be either rook too. So what it probably was is this rook, and I was stacking up because this makes the most logical sense. And I remember doing something like this in the game. So if he goes rook d3, then that makes sense. Yeah, so he went rook d3, so that's what that must have been. That's why notation is rough, because you could write something down thinking, oh yeah, of course I just played rook c6. When in reality, you could have moved either rook, and then also in reality, you could have the penmanship of like a freaking two-year-old like me. So, anyway, this is what happened. Uh, now I probably start advancing these pawns. So after rook to d3, we get b5. <clears throat> and then we get rook to d5. So now he's threatening both of these. And I have to be careful, because even if I move one of them, then he actually can pick up the other one. So if I move this and he picks this up, then I can take, or I can take with pawn. But, uh, anyway... What happens in the game is rook d5, and I do rook c6 to c5. And I'm kind of saying I'm fine with this exchange and that you're not grabbing any of these pawns, and I'm still able to move this after we trade off a pair of rooks. And my king is also closer to the action than his king will be. So I think this is all around pretty good for me. Uh, so rook to c5, we get check. I go king h5. We get rook to d3, so he goes right back to where he was, and I wasn't quite ready to pull this trigger on uh, b4, because the idea is he takes and he hangs his rook, but it's not that simple, because then he would just take my rook right here, and then I pick that up, and he could just slide over to rook a3, and all of a sudden, yes, I still have my pawn, but it's an outside pawn, and I'm protecting it from the side as opposed to to the back. And it's still not easy for me to get my king involved because he's cutting off a lot of these squares. So kind of just super uncomfortable all around. So I didn't want to play b4 just yet. So we get rook to d3 again. Um, rook e5. 
That was just a shuffling move that doesn't really accomplish anything right there. I just wanted to maintain this line, but see if I can find a better square for it. Maybe the king ends up somewhere okay. I don't know. But that's my thought process. <clears throat> Maybe I could just put my rook here and go for a cheeky mate. We get rook e5, rook h3 check. And now I was also considering king going to g4 and sacking the pawn. And I was thinking maybe I have some sort of checkmate on the way. But it didn't seem so obvious. Because he could barely defend it. And I was thinking, okay, well I could just push this pawn. And then maybe at the right moment I just turn that into a queen. And then he's in trouble. But I didn't see anything concrete. And like I said, it was in time trouble. So instead of doing this, I just went with a safer move. I think king g6. Or I blocked with a rook. But I think I played king g6. Yes, king g6, and I actually circled this because I wasn't sure if this was the right move or if I had a win right here. So let me turn on lines. So king g4 and king g6 look to be the same exact evaluation. So looks like it doesn't really matter what happens. What happens if he takes? So now I can play before because I'm no longer losing this. So that's the idea there. Um, yeah, I guess that's all to that right there uh, so that wasn't even too hard to calculate I probably just was missing the fact that I could play b4 already but I went here he went rook to d2 and I can't take so I actually felt like I was losing progress right here because now he was kind of on the attack and his king can get free kind of quick so after rook d2 I went rook e6 just prevented against that check thought maybe I could slide back here and then move something um, just some more shuffling really we get rook to d5 uh, where's d5 right here so again he's just trying to threaten these guys and yeah just kind of uncomfortable so I'm assuming rook b6 is that right yeah rook b6 then we have rook h is that rook h to d3 I assume Mm. Eric HD3. So I play B4 now, and the thing, or that my idea was that if he tries to trade this off, that you know, I'm gonna be pretty happy here. Maybe I didn't actually think that through. Um, King F5. All right, so yeah, I, I probably saw this and thought that sure I'm still side to side with the pawn, but my king is one step closer than it was, and I'm no longer getting cut off by the rook either, and this doesn't really make a difference because it's still pretty protected, and this is running pretty quick. So that was the thought process. But that didn't really end up happening. What happened after b4 was takes, takes. I was happy with this because now I'm supporting it this way again. We get... Uh, <clears throat> rook b3 where is that oh he just blocks it um so we get rook b3 rook c3 and i'm offering him an exchange and just kind of saying yeah i'm still going to be defending this pawn sideways but i could eventually get a check in and then maybe push and defend again something along those lines and all of a sudden, I'm one square from promoting. So that's my mindset here. And I think we got the exchange off of the rooks. Yeah, rook takes, x takes, then rook c5. So I think maybe check here and here. Let me double check. Rook b3. Okay, so I went this way instead. Which I don't think is terrible, but I also don't think it's good. Because he actually can beat me here, I think. Or just check me. So I don't know why I play that exactly. Um, but rook b3 was played. We get king g2. Uh, king h5. Rook to c4. I'm just cutting off my moves. We get g4. So I can move. We get f3. 
And here was where I had a decision because I could move this pawn in two different ways, one square. I could, let me turn off these lines. I know it's a draw from there. But here I had a few options. And what I could do is either take, king takes, check. And he has to uh, get out of the way of check and then I support it. Or what, he could, what I could do is I could just check him first and then push the pawn. But the problem was that he could always take here and then that would be check on me and it's supported. So that gives him tempo to then do whatever he wants there. So I didn't want to just check him. I wanted to uh, hopefully do this with check. So I believe I took on f3. Yep, takes on f3, king takes on f3. And then I did c2 check. We get king e2. And I went rook h3. And this is the end of the game right here. And if I were to turn on the lines, yeah, it shows that I'm winning. And I knew that in game two. So the idea here is that I win by opposition if he wants to take this pawn. So if he takes, <clears throat> I take, and then he has to defend his rook, obviously. So I take uh, the rook, and then king recaptures, and I gain opposition on him. And this pawn can run, and he can never break free, because I'm in front of his king. <laughs> And he has no way to support this pawn either. So what I could do is just go up a full pawn and say he just wanted to go here or something. Then yeah, I just have a bonus pawn on him. And this guy's about to start running. So two pass pawns, he won't be able to stop. So what happened in the game is he did take and we had this occur. And he tried getting in the inside line here, but I just cut him off. And he's never going to make there in time. So he ended up resigning as soon as he saw that was possible. So, yeah, I mean, that was the tournament. Um, looks like this video is about an hour long. But it was a quick four-game tournament, uh, 45 minutes plus 5 or plus 10 seconds. I don't remember. Um, but it was fun. I did have COVID at the time of the tournament, so I apologize to all the goers who may have gotten sick from me. And it maybe wasn't COVID, but it was some kind of respiratory or virus or some crap that I am still with right now, even though it's much less severe. But uh, yeah, I was still happy with the result. Um, it was in the U1600 as opposed to the Open, but the Open had people with like 2400 rating and stuff like that, like National Masters, a few FIDE Masters, I think. Um, no, maybe not FIDE, maybe it was Candidate Masters is what it's called. I don't remember, but anyway, I was pretty happy with the result. Um, I'm going to be playing in the next section up for the Charleston tournament, but there's still a while, a few months to go until then, so I'm just going to keep grinding away. But I hope you guys enjoyed some classic game review from my tournament, and uh, I'll be able to play more games here shortly now that I'm feeling better as well. But uh, yeah, y'all have a good one, and I'll see you later.